When I was three years old, I remember that my parents showed me a movie called Train of Life a French satire of the mid-90s about a Yiddish devil in Eastern Europe which finds out uh, that the whole of the population is going to be deported so the village makes the decision to build a deportation train half of them dress up as Nazis and they try to well, get to Eretz Israel. This story is very unimportant if uh, we think about the grand context, but it is important in the way that we have a topic today which is concerned with Yiddish and Arabic music. My name is Jacob Heiner. I do music under the name of Levi Overson. I am joined today by a dear friend of mine and one of my most favorite people, Mr. Bashir Hamby. Yeah, hello. My name is Bashir al Hamwe. I am 20 years old and I come from Syria, from an Oriental community. What we're going to do today is talk a bit about Yiddish and Arabic music and especially how Western musicians like myself can learn from those musical cultures and uh, mix them with something new. Bashir, what would you say is Semitic music? Semitic, this word uh, in itself describes the Oriental region and its people, regardless of religion of, or ethnicity. And what would you say is Arabic music? Well, Arabic is a really general word. So when you say Arabic, you mean the, the countries in the Orient, the countries in the Arabic Gulf, and the countries in Northern Africa. They are all... Um, joined together with this language that is the Arabic language and therefore they're called Arabic people and the music from which they write is the Arabic music. If we are talking about Yiddish music, we're talking about the music that Jewish communities play which reside outside of the Orient. It bears the roots of the Orient but is an entirely different thing for itself. Let's start with uh, a very fundamental difference between Western music, that is music that has its origins in Europe, and let's for that, uh, for that also include um, uh, Northern America. What is the difference in how Western music is taught versus how Yiddish and Arabic music are taught? Well, having grown up with both Western and Eastern music, I could um, honestly say that the difference here, the main difference is the language in the songs. So the lyrics are um, in Western music are mainly in English or European languages. Um, well, the lyrics in Arabic or Oriental music, let's say, is Arabic. So basically, 
the fundamental difference between both of them is the culture behind the music. So let's say the culture behind Arabic music, or in this sense, Oriental music, is basically feelings. How somebody is connected to um, his land, to his people, to his lover, and so on and so forth. But the Western music is basically based on um, the interaction between them, basically political, let's say, um, senses. Um, well, talking about, let's say, rock, Western rock music, we're talking about um, mainly politics. Well, we're, when we're talking about rock in the sense of Arabic rock, then we're talking about basically um, the main problems found in the community, in the Arabic community, whether it's racism, discrimination, homophobia, everything. These are all, um, they shed lights on these problems. All right, and we're going to delve more into the different themes of Western and Oriental music later on. Uh, what I want to talk about now is more how do people who make music in these different cultures get introduced to learning to play an instrument or to sing or whatever. Because in Western music, there's, well... Uh, essentially two ways. When we're talking about Western classical music, you most often go to a university where you learn to study one instrument, and that is to play uh, Western classical music or other Western styles. And if you don't play classical music, if you play, I don't know, uh, if you want to uh, learn to play guitar, or you want to learn to play piano or drums, there is a um, large field of literature that is available to Western students. So we have um, a lot of people that have written about uh, how you should approach an instrument as a Western musician. Maybe you even go to music school and get a teacher. But essentially... Um, there are many different ways in which you can learn and far more independently uh, because there is so much uh, material that is open to research. Now, how would you say um, in is music taught in the Orient from your perspective? Um, well, mainly if you want to learn music in the Orient, where I grew up, um, you have one of two options. You either learn it independently by yourself or um, you take lessons in a conservatory led by a maestro. And when you choose the second option, you would mainly have to do this early on. So let's say starting from 10 years old. You go to the conservatory about four times a week and this is where you mainly get taught about music theory, about the fundamental differences in Arabic or Western music, and um, the fundamentals of Oriental music. So it uh, has a, a, a lot of similarities with um, learning in the Western context uh, to play classical music, or something as distinctive as jazz, or something like that. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we have mentorship. And uh, w now I want to just uh, briefly talk about how Yiddish music approaches or has approached um, the teaching of music. Because Yiddish music, as well as um, Arabic music, uh, for a long, 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 long time has been transmitted orally. And uh, because of this, I want to note um, a lot of um, musical history and uh, therefore also music, uh, historical music theory has been lost to time. So there are a lot of differences between Western and Arabic and Yiddish music um, in the context of teaching. And I might add that Yiddish music nowadays also 
uh, can be taught in uh, conservatories, but that is a more of a modern approach. Well, I'd say there's a lot of similarities between um, the way Yiddish music is taught and Arabic music is taught. Well, you see, um, since that Arabic music is mainly taught in the conservatory, um, you could also say that there are other ways that it's taught. It's not really common, but it's at the same time not really uncommon. Um, you'd say <sighs> the same way you'd see um, independent, uh, let's say, guitarists in the Western community that have classes in which they teach their um, students how to play the guitar or the, about the different um, guitar styles. Um, the same way is used in the Arabic community while speaking about uh, teaching music theory. Some uh, teachers have exclusive styles that they only teach to their exclusive students. And these styles are, let's say, it's more like a secret that they hold dear to themselves. So you mean that, uh, especially in combination with the uh, variety of regional styles of um, oriental music, there, it, there can be a difference in teaching, in what is taught, yeah. Yeah, yeah, depending on where you're speaking of. All right, so let's get back to themes of uh, Western Yiddish and Arabic music. And I might just start with Yiddish music because uh, this is the most easy to um, talk about it concisely. Yiddish music, um, in all of its tonality, um, has a sense of joy, especially uh, genres like klezmer, because uh, things like klezmer are played at uh, happy occasions like weddings, as I mentioned. So there is a, a, a strong sense of joy, but always with an undertone of um, sorrow because of, because of the nature of Yiddish music. There, all, there was always a a musical homesickness and a longing uh, for a return to the Orient, to the historical home of Judaism. And so there's always uh, this uh, uh, split theme in all of Yiddish music, which is the happy part, the, um, the joy and the celebration, and then uh, the reminder that all that celebration um, isn't, well, celebrated at home, because we are not at home. Well, Arabic music mainly composes about the, the love life of the musician. Um, the musician mainly writes music about um, his significant other, about how he would miss his significant other as soon as he stops seeing them. And it's mainly composed about feelings, about deep feelings, deep sorrow, regret, love, hate, envy, all of them. And yeah, it's also based on the, let's say, uh, the problems in the community, in the Arabic community. Um, like, let's uh, take Feruz or Rahbani brothers, for example. They both wrote about their significant others, about their love life, but they also talked about their land. They have written songs about how um, their lands have been uh, taken advantage of, 
how they have lived during the time of the conflict in the Middle East, during the uh, the time where uh, it's basically after the First and the Second World War, how the whole Arabic, um, let's say Arabic war, took a whole shift, and it didn't, it it became something new, something that not a lot approved of, and they have written about that. So it's very um, uh, timely in the sense of the if you write music at a, a specific point in time, you're gonna write about that point in time. Yeah, exactly. But we're talking about uh, a time period that lasted about two centuries. Um, it started since the uh, the French took over the Levant. The Levant. Um, this word, the Levant, also describes the Orient. The, both words are used interchangeably. And since that, they have written about how their ideologies have been shifted towards a more Western style, which not a lot at the time uh, approved of. And does uh, does the Western style uh, concern itself with uh, the politics or uh, the lifestyle, or, or the also uh, does it refer to the music that was written at that time. I mean, uh, the music, the music that Rahmani brothers composed are music that are music styles that basically describe politics in a more of a folklore standpoint, in a more of a what the community think about the politics, not what the politicians think about politics, what the community wants, what the community yearns for how the community has been uh, has been affected by this shift at the end of the 20th century yeah. how the community have have been hurt by this civil uh, civil wars by the wars that uh, took place during that period of time it's basically okay it's oriented towards touching the listener from the inside about making the listener feel what the musician felt, what the people feel. It's about making you, uh, it's about letting you not only hear the music, but also think about the music, feel about it, um, being touched by it on the inside rather than the, on the outside. It's about changing something fundamental in every listener. So I might ask you uh, something there. Because uh, all you've uh, described uh, for the last few minutes, some people, including myself, would uh, also associate with other musical styles like and other musical cultures like the blues. How would you see that connection? Well, to be honest, uh, when speaking about oriental music, the relationship between the musician and the listener isn't a relationship between a musician and a listener. It's more like um, bonds between a family. It's not like this person is famous, uh, they're playing music for the listeners to enjoy. It's more like the person who is playing the music is trying to connect with the people as their own family. This is the main difference. And that is also uh, something that is um, characteristic for uh, historical Yiddish music because it was music and still is music that is performed by members of a community for members of a community. You've, uh, you've just uh, moved on to our next talking point ever so uh, gracefully, thank you for that. Um, which is the relationship between uh, the performer and the listener in Western Yiddish and Arabic music. And you've already talked a bit about uh, how this relationship forms in Arabic music. I might add something about uh, Yiddish music. Yes, we have uh, a sort of music that is played by one sort of people for the same sort of people, speaking about communities here. Now, if we're talking about uh, other Yiddish music, and I'm talking here about um, music sung by Hasidic Jews, which is a subgroup of 
uh, Orthodox Judaism. There is a a type of song that is sung by Hasidic Jews at an evening table, which is called a nigun or nin, which is um, a table song. So what would happen uh, and what still happens, uh, the recordings of this, is that um, a hundred people or so, or even more, would sit around a long table and sing one melody for half an hour, let's say. It's always the same melody, and they're uh, beating the rhythm with their fists on the table, and uh, the longer this performance, this uh, commune performance goes on, the more um, transcendental uh the song becomes because everyone gets into the zone and um all go hand in hand metaphorically and so all are the same all treated uh, each other like family members and it's very it's very communal it's something that is far more rare in uh western music well uh when speaking about Um, dance music, (sighs) like I said, this deep connection between the musician and the listener also shows during, let's say, celebrations or weddings. Um, (sighs) The band members play the music while the people are, um, they all uh, holding each other's hands, dancing together um, uh, in a dance called Tapke. (sighs) The musicians play the music, and then they switch with other musicians so that the musicians can go dance with the people at the celebration. And sometimes people from uh, from the listeners or maybe the dancers also go play the music for the musicians so that the musicians can go dance with the group. And what I also found interesting in my research um, is that in Arabic music, it is far more common for listeners of a performance, of a live performance, to uh, shout out the joy of the performance itself. So there is this uh, really open communication between performer and listener. The people listening are also part of, uh, are also a part of the band. They sing with the singer. They feel with the singer. Um, Okay, I will... I will mention an example here. Um, there is a singer called Marcel Khalifi. He wrote music about the revolution that took place in the Levant or in the Orient. And while he sang his music, he also partaked in the in the demonstrations in the revolution. He played songs during the revolution. Yeah. He was a part of the revolution. The people in the revolution were his family, were his friends. And he didn't play for them, he played with them. That's the fundamental reason uh, behind this deep connection between the singer and the listeners. It's not a musician-fan type of relationship. It's, It's like family, basically. وشمعنا المرة دي أسنان الشوق يحرك الحنين ومن الأرض اللي يطول ومن عاي عدي بأنا الشوق يحرك الحنين ومن الأرض اللي يطول ومن عاي عدي بأنا Yeah, I feel like I'm 
So our next topic is uh, what are individual characteristics of Arabic and Yiddish music? Well, the first one and the most obvious one to um, a new listener is scales and music theory. Um, when you ask someone, uh, how do I play an oriental scale, uh, most people will tell you just to play something that's called a Phrygian scale, which has a very exotic harmony. And uh, this scale is common as well in Yiddish um, and Arabic music. Uh, Yiddish music also has another scale that is called the altered um, Dorian scale. And if you get a bit of uh, into listening to Yiddish music, you will find that that scale really sounds Yiddish and not just uh, somehow Oriental. But if we're uh, talking about uh, performance and especially uh, instrument techniques, in Yiddish music, as well as in Arabic music, there is this concept of melodic size, which is sliding up to a note and then immediately uh, dropping down seamlessly, which is um, something that is more, uh, much more emulating a, a vocal performance, or, um, even if you play it on an instrument. Um, but it is very, uh, very heavily used in Yiddish as well as in Arabic music. And I might also add, as a guitar player, it is far more easy to get those sighs um, with an unfretted instrument than with a fretted instrument. But that's just me. Um, other things that are common in Yiddish as well as Arabic music are... What else? Uh, yeah, uh, a concept that uh, uh, a concept that in Arabic music is called uh, tarab, which, uh, if I remember correctly, translated means joy. Well, to be honest, if you were to mention the fundamentals in Arabic music from music theory standpoint, then you'd have to mention the oud. Oh yeah, of course. The oud having no frets. Gives the player um, the freedom of playing whatever he wants, and here we um, microtonality plays here a major role. Arabic music is heavily dependent on microtonality. Mada, Mada, stop you just there. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I, I just quickly want to explain what microtonality is. There is this Western concept of. Um, dividing an octave into seven notes uh, or uh, 12 half notes, which we in Western music theory call the 12 tone equal, temperament, uh, equal temperament system. So between an octave, uh, uh, between a note and its octave, there are 12 notes and those 12 notes are equally divided along their octave. Other musical cultures have um, other um, uh, separations of an octave. And if you diverge from the 12 tone equal tempered system, so if you play a note between, let's say, A and B flat, we get into the realm of microtonality because we are playing the notes in between nodes, which are so-called microtones and this is what you just mentioned yeah, yeah exactly so when we mention the guitar each fret corresponds to a half note but having no frets at all the player has the freedom of playing in between the frets which correspond to the microtones between the two half steps and this is something that is taught at a really young age that's why i mentioned that they start music start learning music at the age of 10 or even younger so that they they train themselves to have something that we call musical ear which is really similar to having perfect pitch just that you have good intonation when you're playing the oud yeah yeah so that you more or less can identify the note or the micro note um, only by listening to it 
and this gives the wood player this ability to play without having any frets and playing the Arabic melodies, which are, like I said, heavily dependent on microtonality. If my research is correct, um, different uh, regions of the Orient will um, uh, prefer certain microtones over others, so, so uh, uh, certain notes would be played much more flat or sharper, uh, depending on the region where uh, the same piece is played. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, if you took Syria, for example, yeah. Syria has a lot of regions that have special styles of playing. So, if we took Damascus, the, uh, the capital of Syria, it has more or less eight or nine regions, each of which have um, each of which has a completely different style of playing, and this also applies to other regions. It's really it's really versatile and really exclusive to the player it, uh, himself and the region, the exact region from which he comes from. A last characteristic of Arabic music that I might uh, want to mention is um, the concept of scale. In Western music theory, apart from pentatonic scales, um, we generally talk about heptatonic scales, which have uh, s seven notes between a note and its octave, and it's almost always a heptatonic scale, except for when you play blues or something like that. But in Arabic music, scales or makams are uh, generally just pentatonic because uh, the, the, it's just uh, a different uh, concept of scale and you can stack uh, two different macombs over one another so you would have a super scale and if you improvise uh, on an instrument as the oud um, you would uh, much more um, improvise uh, on the fundament of different macombs than just one tonality or just one scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this also applies when talking about singing. Um, when people in the Orient want to learn this whole skill, let's say, it's not a talent, it's a skill that's taught um, of singing. It, it's heavily dependent on the fundamentals of choir. Yeah. So uh, the singer, takes a lot of a lot of lessons with their maestro which uh, plays um, on a piano and teaches the singer to nail every note on the piano and it's heavily dependent on the on the way um, the singers in a choir are divided so uh, in the sense of bass, baritone, and tenor, or alto and soprano. But what's really popular, or let's say um, the more used in the Arabic style of music, is the soprano and the tenor um, parts of singing. Yeah. It's really dependent on high notes, in the sense of really high notes. Yeah. And it's a skill that the singers have, uh, the, singers have the need to learn from a really young age, speaking of five or six years old, at the least. And it really shows in the music when you hear, most of the Arabic music has um, uh, singing in high notes. And that's exactly why. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I might mention that uh, some weeks before this broadcast, I uh, you have sent me a lot of um, Arabic music as a reference to listen to and whenever there was a vocal performance um, mostly a female one it was I thought all right th this is like the uh, uh, the singer must have had an education that is uh, equ equivalent to an opera singer because that that, that, that is amazing what they can do.
So we uh, uh, now move on to um, the second to last question. How have Yiddish and Arabic music changed over time? And I'm just going to start with Yiddish music because this is also very concise. Um, with uh, the beginning of the 20th century, most of all, uh, in the second half onwards, Yiddish music has merged with many different uh, other different styles of, let's say, more modern music, such as jazz. Yiddish uh, music is very prevalent in m modern jazz, um, as well as rock, punk, um, musical theater, if you want to call that a genre. And we can generally say that nowadays there is there are as much uh, Yiddish musical genres as there are musical genres. And uh, so it's uh, just a matter of um, uh, adding new instruments or styles of playing to the uh, pre-existing Yiddish uh, style of music. And do you want to briefly uh, talk about how Arabic music has changed before we talk about uh, uh, a contemporary artist of Arabic music? The way Arabic music has shifted is it's shifted towards a more of, um, let's say, a blend of Arabic and Western music. So when you're mentioning bands, I would mention Mashra Layla or Al Murabba. Or also Akhir Zafir. Or Yasmin Hamdan. Yeah, yeah. Or Yasmin Hamdan, exactly. When we're talking about these types of singers or bands, uh, we're talking about a blend between Western rock or Western altered, uh, indie rock and Arabic, Arabic music in a nutshell. Which is, for example, just give one. So these bands, um, as well as uh, Lean Adib, Jadal, or also Tanjari Dabat, they are also uh, bands that heavily depend on this um, on these fundamentals of Western rock music. Um, basically, mixing between the Western and Arabic mu uh, instruments. Let's say, for instance, Mashal Ira has a violinist, um, a guitarist, and a wood player. It also sometimes experiments with uh, session mu uh, musicians that also uh, play the kanun or the flute. And it's really present in their last album. It's basically a mix, a really obvious mix between Arabic and Western alternative rock. And I might also add, if you listen to Mashru Leila, which I totally recommend, um, you uh, also get much more of a uh, much more of a sense of uh, modern Western music production, meaning um, uh, samples, how stuff is mixed, at uh, what instruments are used, of course, and uh, it's really fascinating because it almost sounds like. Um, and th 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 this is a bit critical of a, d a statement, like Western rock music just with an Arabic text, but it's still r really Arabic music. Mashru Leila are, uh, as you told me, one of the, um, uh, one of the m musical representatives on uh, of contemporary um, Lebanese, especially Lebanese music. Yeah, yeah. Mashra Leila were the pioneers of the new era of, let's say, Arabic rock. It's a whole genre by itself. And they were followed by at least five or other uh, or six other bands that also um, were inspired by their style. They were people that are just like me, people that grew up with both Arabic and Western music. Um, and it's really present in their music, uh, in their singing, in their vocals. Yeah. Um, they play Western melodies mm, with a bit of an Arabic taste in it, yeah. with also heavily depending on high, to high notes. 
in singing. I mean, uh, uh, the singer of Masru Leila, as well as Yasmin Hamdan, um, both have really extraordinary uh, voices, I might say that. So it's, it's, it's really good stuff. Yeah, yeah. And the singer of Masru Leila is also um, a person that grew up in the conservatory. He started uh, taking lessons there at the age of seven years old. Yeah, exactly. And what I also find uh, uh, kind of charming about him is that he's a graphic design student or that he was such as I am. <laughs> so maybe I'll, uh, maybe one day I'll learn to sing if I just uh, finish my degree in graphic design. He's also uh, an, an advocate for the, uh, let's say, acceptance of the LGBT community in the Oriental community. As as a as a member of the LGBTQ plus community himself, yeah. he he just strives for this, let's say, not acceptance, but for the living together with harmony and peace. Which is again what you uh, mentioned before the um, the timeliness of uh, Arabic uh, of certain Arabic music that. Um, music is made just uh, not just for the time, meaning how the music sounds, but it is, it is also written about the time that it is performed in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. They make music about the political in, uh, incidents um, after 2010 or 2012, which is the Syrian war, the revolution in Lebanon, the revolution in Syria. Uh, the conflict uh, in the Orient, about everything. They just want to shed light about the importance of living in peace, accepting one another. And as much as I would love to talk about Meshru Leila and Yasmin Hamdan for like the rest of the day, we have one final question that we have to talk about briefly. Now, uh, the question concerns uh, itself with uh, the approach that Western musicians such as me um, can have to uh, other uh, musical cultures such as Yiddish and Arabic music. I'm asking this question because in preparation for this broadcast, I myself composed um, some music that was um, inspired by my research into Yiddish and Arabic music, and you definitely get the taste for that. But uh, how would you say, um, well, what is possible for Western musicians uh, if they want to um, get into uh, styles that are very reminiscent of uh, Arabic music? Can they really play Arabic music at, the, at some point or do they just uh, have to be uh, concerned with playing music that is inspired by Arabic music? Well, playing Arabic music has little to no necessity of the person being an Arab. It just heavily depends on the person learning the fundamentals of Arabic music and Arabic microtonality. Yeah. And in this sense, any musician in the whole world that wants to get to know um, Arabic style of playing and the Arabic music in general, not only Oriental, but the Arabic music generally, then uh, these people can not only find such resources on the internet, but also find 
um, fellow Arabic people that are that would be more than happy to help them and to bring them into learning these styles. Um, as a member of the Arabic community that is living in Europe, I could say with honesty that Arabic people are overall in every single fucking land in this world. They are just, they, they, they're scattered across the whole globe, which means that they carry their culture and their music with them. And at this time, it's impossible to not at least once listen to an Arabic song, even by mistake. And if you had questions about it, or let's say, if you just felt it touching you, then you can just ask anybody over the internet or in person, and they would be more than happy to help you and to teach you about their culture, about their music, because they're, they're, they're the type of people that are proud, and they just, they just want to tell the whole world about themselves, and they just want to make peace with everyone in this world. And this plays a huge role about them um, teaching the whole world about their music, about their culture about what makes them who they are. Yeah, and that is uh, already enough to learn for a lifetime. And um, I also want to mention, we both know that I really, uh, not just uh, grew up a bit with uh, Middle Eastern uh, Oriental music, but also now that I have... known some people who can give me more reference for that that i enjoy this music more and more and enjoy more and more to get some elements of it into my style of playing and this is um um sorry uh and this is also really important to me uh uh to mention uh we're gonna hear a song now um, with which we are at the end of our broadcast. I wrote the song in uh, almost a couple uh, collaboration with you because um, I used to send you demos of the song and you told me whether they sounded oriental or not or what I should maybe change, what I should think about. And now that we have the finished song, um, if, I love it. Uh, and I uh, love w- uh, working with you on that kind of stuff. You have a good taste in music, I might say that. <laughs> Thank you. I love working with you as well. To be honest, it's my personal opinion, but I can objectively say that this song is a fucking masterpiece. It's <laughs> one of a kind. I'm going to put that in my, uh, my uh, curriculum vitae the next time I'm searching yeah. for a job. <laughs> I've written a song that is a fucking masterpiece, <laughs> thank says you Bosch. Much. All right, Bosch, I thank you so much for doing this with me. It was a pleasure. It was my pleasure to partake in this interview with you. This uh, this was Jacob Arne and Bashir Hamby. Goodbye. A public service announcement from the edit. The following song, Tehuid Abel Matla Al Fajer Lullaby Before Dawn, will be released by Levi Hovison as a single on July 27th and will be included on the album Bedagovsky to be released by Levi Hovison on July 30th. Come into every place where you can stream music.